I did not put the video. Because if I put the video, then it's just going to be I might be, I mean, but without the video, I don't know. It's just recording it. Yeah, so it's, yeah. I mean, it's I mean, but what's the point of recording soon? We'll make a video. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's going to be a little weird. <laughs> it's going to be a video uh, soon. That's, that you might be seeing yourself in the video. So. <laughs> it's just wanted to let you know. Okay, why don't we get started? Uh, welcome everyone to the Honey Haber Memorial Lecture. Uh, my name is uh, Gabriel Zamos Regueros. I am an associate professor at the philosophy department. I want to thank you all for uh, coming out today uh, to the area campus and uh, to the Lawrence building. Uh, the philosophy department at the University of Colorado Denver hosts this lecture every year in memory of Honey Haber who was a professor at the department uh, who specialized in continental and feminist philosophy. This, like every year's lecture, is made possible by the generous support of Honey's parents, uh, Charles and Millicent uh, Haber, both of whom have since passed away. Their extraordinary gift not only established this lecture series and has kept it running, but also helped fund our department's library, which is a wonderful resource for our students and faculty alike. I want first to take this opportunity to thank uh, the two people who are truly the organizing minds behind these and every event really that our department puts together and who among many other tasks have helped to secure the room, uh, the equipment and the food and beverages for the small reception that will follow the event. Uh, they are our wonderful program assistants who last three years assistant David Morton uh, because David is out sick today, our colleagues, uh, Jay uh, Golub and Andrew Kane, and I also saw Brian Lyle and uh, Robert Metcalf. As you can see, we're a collective organization. We help each other out uh, quite a bit. I have generally stepped in uh, to help with some of the logistics, uh, including the operation of the camera that is recording the event. So I'll, I want to acknowledge all these people and uh, I want you to help me thank them for their support in making this event happen. So thank you. As I mentioned, uh, the Haber Lecture is held in uh, Honey's memory. Each year, we invite a philosopher who works in areas closely related to Honey, who worked uh, who, um, to those Honey worked on, uh, to come share their knowledge and expertise with us. The lecture gives us the opportunity to bring really superb scholars in the field. And on this occasion, it is an immense pleasure for me and a great privilege to introduce to you this year's lecturer, Dr. Frederick Neuhauser, who is no exception to this rule, for he's truly a towering and formidable figure in the field of continental philosophy. I first met Fred when I was an undergrad student at UC San Diego, and he was a teacher there some years ago. I won't say how many, not just out of respect for the most elemental rules of courtesy, but also in order not to betray my longstanding, perhaps futile tradition of refusing to acknowledge the relentless and unmerciful passage of time. <laughs> From that moment on, however, I gravitated toward his classes and lectures, which I attended with almost religious fervor, for I was entranced by the spectacular rigor, depth, and the lucidity that he so masterfully displayed in those settings and that has always accompanied all expressions of his scholarly work. Since then, he has been a continuous to be a role model of the genuine philosopher I wish I could one day perhaps become. And hopefully perhaps sometimes I, with modest uh, measure of success, uh, become. But if so, on those very brief moments of life, uh, I certainly, uh, I think, are partly owed uh, to him and to his example. Uh, Fred's very fertile scholarly activity covers a range that is truly astonishing and breathtaking and includes, alongside many articles, one book on Fichte, one on Hegel, two books on Rousseau, and his latest monograph, Diagnosing Social Pathology, which, if I'm not mistaken, just came out, and in which readers will be able to find insightful discussions, not just on some of the philosophers I already mentioned, but also on figures as varied as Plato, Marx, and Durkheim. What is even more extraordinary, and in no way an exaggeration, is that in all of these works, Fred has made lasting contributions 
that reorient our understanding of these thinkers and set new standards for future scholarship. Now, before I yield the podium to our guest speaker, and perhaps especially in the light uh, of the topic of today's lecture, which deals with the concept of property, I want to acknowledge that this event is happening on an area that belongs to the traditional territories and ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Ute nations. And in particular, the confluence of the Plate and the Cherry Creek Rivers was a cultural conclave uh, in which over 45 indigenous nations met and had meaningful and important cultural exchanges with each other before they were forcefully removed and deprived from this land. Let us remember their painful history and let us honor them for being the original stewards of this land and for continuing to be stewards of it by giving thanks to all tribal nations and their ancestors uh, in this place. Now, uh, without further ado, uh, I don't want to prolong this. As they say, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Newhouse. Uh, thank you very much, Gabriel, for that really nice introduction. It's very gratifying to see that some of your students make it in the world of academia, because of course, you know, there are so many who don't. Um, I also want to thank Gabriel and um, Sirastri for organizing this event and making it so, so far it's gone really smoothly. And um, it's like the first time in two and a half years I've flown without things being canceled or delayed or So that was really nice. In her influential book, Beyond Postmodern Politics, Honey Fernhaber writes, quoting here, the work presented here is part of an ongoing project to formulate an oppositional politics where politics is conceived broadly enough to include what bourgeois liberalism has relegated to the sphere of the private. My notion of oppositional politics understands a political theory to be viable to the extent to which it's able to pay attention to difference, to those voices or concerns that have been marginalized by disciplinary and normalizing power regimes. The lecture I'm gonna to give today is quite distant from the concerns of postmodernism with which Professor Haber was occupied in her book and her career. Yet my hope is that this lecture might not be so foreign to her interests insofar as in addressing a staggering rise of economic inequality in the past four decades, it might be seen as a part of oppositional politics and a paying attention to the situations of those who've been marginalized. I didn't know Professor Haber personally, but I'm moved by the tribute paid to her on the department website. And I'd like to remind you of it before I begin. I actually think this is written in the, in the library too, on a plaque, I'm not sure about that. Honey was a dedicated teacher, organizer of student activities and role model, especially for women. She will be sorely missed by all who came into contact with her with an open mind and heart. Okay, so I'll start now. A recent article in the New York Times presents statistics regarding levels of economic inequality in the US that are on the one hand astounding, but that on the other hand, no longer surprise us because over the last decade or so, ever since the publication of Thomas Piketty's pathbreaking book on inequality, Capital in the 21st Century, we've become accustomed to hearing such statistics. These empirical facts impress us when we first hear them, but we tend to forget them quickly because the numerical relations they convey are too abstract to convey a, con a concrete picture of the reality they describe. For this reason, I'll restrict myself to reminding you of only a few of the statistics that document the alarming growth in economic inequality. After that, I'll turn to more philosophical matters. So according to the New York Times, the richest 0.1%, that's one thousandth of households in the United States, now own approximately 20% of the nation's total wealth. In 1980, that figure was only 7.4%. That's okay. It used to really, really annoy me when people's cell phones went off. That was when I didn't have a cell phone. <laughs> and I got one only very recently. 
um, being a Rousseauian. Um, and after I got when I, I don't get angry anymore because I understand it happens. It's hard. 1.1% now have a combined net worth equal to the bottom, to the combined net worth of the bottom 85%. That means that the richest 300,000 U.S. Americans own approximately as much wealth as the poorest 2.8 million of their compatriots. This extreme economic inequality correlates directly with increased racial inequality. The median wealth of white households is now 10 times higher than that of black households. 20 years ago, that ratio was only seven to one. Gender inequalities are less severe than racial ones, but still very high. Extreme inequalities in wealth also track disparities in quality of life, including life expectancy. U.S. Americans in the bottom fourth of the income distribution die about 13 years earlier on average than those in the top fourth. And none of these statistics tracks global inequality, which though more complex than national inequality, is even more alarming. Economic inequality in the US and Great Britain is considerably worse than in Europe, but France and Germany are beginning to exhibit similar trends. In those two countries, the richest 10% own around 60% of national wealth, and half of their population owns nothing at all. That is, no wealth that can be converted into interest or profit, which is to say that all of their earnings come from wages, gained through labor, rather than as a return on capital. Inequality began to increase throughout Europe in the 1980s, and since then it's continued to rise steadily, if not as quickly as in the US and the UK. And this trend shows no sign of abating. According to Piketty, inequalities in European societies appear to be headed towards the very high levels that characterized Europe in the Gilded Age before World War I. One of Piketty's best known theses is that the period in which inequality in Europe and the US decreased significantly, so the period between um, the First World War and 1980, was a historical anomaly. In other words, his thesis is that there's a strong tendency inherent in capitalist economies for inequality to increase as long as it's not counteracted by political measures aimed at reducing inequality. As Piketty says, I'm quoting now, when the rate of return on capital exceeds the rate of growth of output and income, as it did in the 19th century, and seems quite likely to do again in the 21st, capitalism automatically gener generates arbitrary and unsustainable inequalities that radically undermine the values on which democratic societies are based. Moreover, this is me now. Contrary to what many economists have claimed, there's no, this is Piketty again, there's no natural spontaneous process intrinsic to capitalism that prevents destabilizing inegalitarian forces from prevailing permanently. Piketty's prediction for the 21st century aren't much different from Marx's claims regarding the general law of capitalist accumulation and the dynamics of the industrial reserve army, although his explanations of trends or inequality rest on different arguments from Piketty's Marxist do. I can't assess the merit of either of these arguments here. I can't really assess the merits of them anywhere. I'm not an economist, but Piketty's impressive empirical studies provide considerable support for his claims regarding at least the fact of rapidly increasing inequality. It's worth asking, as Marx did, if it's really inequality, whether in income or wealth, that we ought to be most concerned with? Marx's answer, I believe, is no. What matters most, he would say, isn't relative wealth, but whether all have access to the resources they need in order to live a productive, affirmable life. And the most important barrier to this in the modern world, he believes, is class, class differences rather than unequal wealth. Accordingly, some Marxists criticize Piketty for focusing too narrowly on inequality and only indirectly on class. Marx is correct, I think, to give priority to differences in class, but this doesn't imply that Marxists should dismiss Piketty's work. After all, class divisions are defined by a species of unequal wealth, ownership or not, of the means of production. And the distinction Piketty emphasizes between those who live only from income from income 
One important difference between the world Piketty analyzes and one studied by Marx is the rise in the second half of the 20th century of what he calls a large patrimonial middle class that owns significant income generating wealth and therefore lives off of not only wages or salaries, but also returns on capital. For example, many people own their homes and that's quite a large uh, investment in many cases. This fact blurs somewhat the categorical distinction Marx drew between bourgeoisie and working class and the large size of this so-called patrimonial middle class, although it too has begun to shrink, counts as one reason Marx did not have for worrying about inequalities of wealth that don't exactly amount to class distinctions in the strict classical sense. Moreover, if inequalities in wealth are worth caring about, then so too are inequalities in income, since especially today, given the super salaries earned by CEOs and managers of large firms, inequalities in income rapidly turn into inequalities in wealth. If, inequality, if economic inequality in general and not merely class inequality becomes our concern, then the question arises as to what's wrong or dangerous about high levels of, of inequality, Social philosophers generally agree that not all economic inequality is bad, which raises the question of when and on what basis it's to be criticized. As I noted earlier, Piketty is worried by the effects inequality has on democratic culture and politics. He seems also to be moved by two considerations articulated more precisely by John Rawls. First, that large inequalities are unjust, because they fail to distribute the rewards of cooperative social production fairly. And second, that enduring inherited inequalities prevent us from achieving a central component of a just society, the fair equality of opportunity that makes social mobility possible. I've argued elsewhere that Rousseau provides further resources for criticizing economic inequality insofar as it makes it easier for the well-off to dominate the poor to dictate to them what they must do, not merely in politics, but in everyday life. As Adam Smith also realized, because the relations of dependence among rich and poor, he actually used the class distinctions among masters and workers, are asymmetric, the poor depend more urgently on the cooperation of the wealthy than vice versa, the rich are more likely to be in a position of power in relation to those who own less. These are important normative issues concerning inequality, but they're not my main concern today. One reason for this is that there seems to be substantial agreement among both philosophers and non-philosophers that, as well as in part why, large degrees of economic inequality are undesirable. Yet this consensus appears to have little effect on whatever social forces are responsible for increases in inequality. This may be due in part to our ignorance of what social forces of what those social forces are and how they work. But the problem is also larger than this, as can be seen by the genuinely puzzle, puzzling phenomenon in the United States, that even when people recognize the dangers of inequality, many regularly endorse and vote for policies that clearly exacerbate the problem and even worsen their own lot. Rather than explore these normative issues further, I want to examine today how excessive inequalities in wealth have typically been justified in the modern era in order to understand better both why the disadvantaged often support policies that exacerbate inequality and what form our critique of inequality should take today, or at least part of what, how, how our critique of inequality today should look. Rousseau, Marx, and Piketty all agree that the persistence of inequality depends in part on forms of ideology that implicitly or explicitly justified to the less well-off their disadvantaged condition. Piketty formulates this point especially dramatically. Here's another quotation from him. Every human society must justify its inequalities. Unless reasons for them are given, the whole political and social edifice stands in danger of collapse. So in the modern era, there seem to be two principal ways in which economic inequality has been defended directly, both of which have their source in John Locke. The first of these is found in chapter five of the second treatise on government, where Locke depicts the rich as industrious, frugal, and talented, and the poor as lazy spendthrifts who lack the productive skills to be of much value to society. If we abstract from differences in natural capacities, this view justifies inequality by regarding the property of the rich 
as the result of prudent choices and arbitrary and salutary character traits. Because they've honed their skills, worked hard, and saved what they've earned, the rich deserve what they have. The second modern way of justifying inequality directly is to argue that existing inequalities are morally acceptable because apart from whether the rich deserve what they own, inequalities improve the lot of the poor by providing the rich with an incentive to put their wealth to work in ways that increase productivity and eventually benefit everyone. I don't want to reject the principle behind this justification of inequality, although the application of economic inequality underlying Rawls' difference principle. Yet, as he recognizes, to the extent that this justification of inequality is valid, it falls far short of justifying the great extremes of inequality characteristic of Western societies today. To take just one example, no sober observer can seriously entertain the possibility that CEOs who earn yearly salaries of millions of dollars, while the average employee in their firm earns less than 1% of this amount, increase productivity to an extent that justifies their exorbitant pay as beneficial to all. To take an example from my own institution, in 2018, the total compensation of the president of Columbia University was $4.5 million. That's approximately 23 times the average salary of professors, and 75 times more than the average salary of the people who run the university, the mostly female department administrators who keep the university running on a day-to-day -day basis. Although these direct justifications of inequality have their share of adherence, I don't wanna deny that, they're far too weak as arguments in my view to explain why drastically disadvantaged individuals accept their economic condition as just, natural, or deserve undeserving of critique. As with any form of ideology, there are plenty of non-cognitive factors that help explain why people believe what they do. But in my role as a philosopher, I'll concentrate on ideas that have the effect of justifying inequality to rich and poor alike. According to Piketty, and this I agree with, and I think it's an important insight, that's actually what the, paper, the, the talk is really about, the historically most effective justifications of inequality have been indirect, where what's justified isn't in the first place inequality, but some something more fundamental, namely the rights like to accumulate it unlimited or you know, relatively unlimited quantities of it. In other words, the historically most influential justifications of economic inequality depend on taking the right to private property as quasi absolute, implying that individuals have a nearly unlimited right to use their property as they see fit. And if great inequalities arise from that, they must be recognized as the legitimate result of that rightful use. I regard Locke Kant and Robert Nozick as proponents of this view of property. Although each of their positions is more complex than my its description of it implies. Locke, for example, recognizes that rights of private property in a state of nature are subject to certain constraints of general welfare by the principle, for example, that no one may acquire so much that there's not enough and as good as left over for others. Yet the main thrust of chapter five of the second treatise is to argue that in all but the most rudimentary societies, such constraints ultimately pose no limits to the acquisition of property. Because, for example, private ownership, especially of land, this is this familiar argument again, gives owners a financial incentive to increase the productivity of what they own, thereby creating more for everyone and ensuring that all will have more than they would have had in the undeveloped state. Kant's deontological defense of property rights comes closer to the idea that property rights are absolute. His official view is that property rights can rightfully be limited only by prop the property rights or freedom claims of others, but not by considerations of well being. For Kant, the nearly absolute right to use one's property as one sees fit derives from the value of freedom, in this case, external freedom, as he puts it the freedom to act as one wants without interference from others and from the incomparably greater value of freedom, for Kant, 
in relation to the empirically conditioned value of well-being. Locke introduces a, similar, a similarly deontological point into his view, insofar as he derives the right to property from an inalienable right to freedom that's given to, human, by, to humans by God. In both cases, the tight connection between property and freedom, allow to use one's property as one sees fit that each of them endorses. Whatever philosophical nuances there might be in Locke's and Kant's positions, they normally get lost when those ideas filter down to non-philosophers, where they operate in the real world as forms of ideology. In this case, justifying private property as a quasi-sacred, inviolable right. This is true even of the French Revolution's Declaration of the Rights of Man, which considers the right to property, quote, an inviolable and sacred right, on par with the rights to liberty, safety, and resistance against oppression. That's putting them at a pretty fundamental level. Marx acknowledges the ideological function of philosophical ideas in capital when, after locating the source of surplus value in the exploitation of labor, he caricatures the normative understanding of ordinary participants in capitalism that makes exploitation appear as legitimate by invoking the ideals of, as he puts it, freedom, equality, property, and Bentham. His thought is that the ideals of freedom and private property legitimize the ongoing exploitation of workers because the purchase of labor power violates the property rights of no one and the freedom of capitalists to do with their property as they wish may not be abrogated. One of the merits of Piketty's second major book, Capital and Ideology, is that it provides something that philosophers in general can't, namely an empirical history of how ideologies of private property have in fact functioned in the modern era to justify gross inequalities in wealth. In this real world context, philosophical subtleties play no role. What matters rather is a widespread belief in the sacredness or untouchability of private property that implies a nearly unlimited right of owners to use their property as they wish, as long as others' property rights aren't violated. One could adduce many examples of this attitude towards property, but I'll mention only one. Well, actually, I think I go on to mention more, but I'm going to focus on one here in the United States, a relatively small example, but nevertheless, it's revealing. In many communities in the US, shopping malls are the only approximation to public spaces that exist. Yet these public spaces, as it were, are privately owned. And for that reason, their owners are permitted to place limits on the use of those spaces that wouldn't be allowed in genuinely public spaces. Owners of shopping malls in the US are permitted, for example, to exclude certain undesirable groups from their property, the homeless, young people in search of a place to meet and play, and so on, thereby denying them the right of free association in the only public space their communities have. Moreover, owners are permitted to restrict freedom of speech in ways that would be prohibited in genuinely public spaces. Groups who enter these public spaces, as it were, in order to hand out leaflets against climate change or to demonstrate in favor of unionization drives are frequently removed from the premises by the mall's private security forces, which is to say, coercively. Not long ago, a group, just one tiny example, a group known as the Foot Locker 8 went to the Mall of New Hampshire to hand out leaflets showing how shoe manufacturers were exploiting workers in developing countries. The members of this group were arrested for trespassing on private property. The mall owners said they wouldn't tolerate activity within the mall that didn't generate business. This example is only indirectly related to economic inequality, but it illustrates the principle that property owners are permitted to use what they own as befits their private ends, and in this case, making a profit, and often in ways that fail to respect democratic freedoms. There are many other examples of property rights being treated as sacred and inviolable that have had much graver consequences than being excluded or silenced by the owners of shopping malls. The most glaring of these involves the insistence in the 19th century on making the making the abolition state compensate slaves they would be required to set free. free. 
Among what we offer on the state company, affirming the right of slaveholders to compensation was regarded as a self-evident preliminary to any discussion of the abolition of slavery. The history of the demise of slave societies is rife with such examples. In the colonies of the United Kingdom in 1833, in France's abolition in 1848, in the emancipation of slaves in Brazil in 1871, and so on. Of course, slaves received no compensation for their years of involuntary labor. The most egregious example of this pattern is Haiti, which again is in the news um, for especially grievous reasons. What is often but misleadingly described as the first successful slave revolt in 1791 resulted in the legal abolition of slavery, but only at a debilitating cost to the entire nation, the consequences of which are still evident in the poverty and political chaos that continues to plague Haiti. The French colonizers of Haiti agreed to refrain from invading the newly liberated country and recovering their property, but only on the condition that the Haitian state pay 150 million gold francs, in today's currency, that's about 40 billion euros, to compensate the French slaveholders who lost their slaves in the revolt. This sum was so outrageous that Haiti incurred a foreign debt to France that could never be repaid. For over 150 years, the former victims of slavery were forced to live in extreme poverty, while the largest part of their labor went to reimbursing bursing their former masters. And today in the US, we complain about Haitian refugees who risk their lives to escape this poverty and try to enter our country. A more just response might be to invite them in and make the French pay for their food, housing, which enslavement continued, all of which was a completely logical consequence of the belief in the sacredness of private property. In sum, there can be no question that the alleged untouchability of property rights has been and continues to be one of the main ideological pillars of the deep inequality that plagues the world today. A further merit of Piketty's empirical focus in capital and ideology is that by forsaking the pristine realm of pure philosophy, he's able to show how in real proprietarian societies like ours, the defense of the unlimited rights of property owners has typically woven together multiple ideological justifications rather than simply invoking the value of freedom. This is precisely what Marx suggests when he characterizes the ideological justification of exploitation as bringing together the ideals of freedom, equality, property, and Bentham. Bentham, I take it, refers to the justification of unlimited accumulation I attributed early to Locke and to tri trickle down economics, what Piketty calls the theology of the free market, namely the idea resuscitated in the 1980s under Reagan and Thatcher, once again in the UK by the former prime minister, Liz Truss, that some people's being very rich and motivated to produce efficiently makes us all better off than we would be without such inequality. In other words, what in the real world has typically made the unlimited rights of property owners appeal unassailable, even to the poor, is a conglomerate of mutually reinforcing ideological considerations. The values and freedom of freedom and the welfare of all are two important elements of this justification. But Piketty also draws our attention to a third argument I haven't yet mentioned that he claims has had the greatest effect of all. Again and again throughout history, even among participants in the French Revolution, efforts to redistribute property or to regulate its accumulation have been stymied by an almost religious faith in the idea that any interference with existing property arrangements would disrupt social stability so severely that the very existence of society would be in danger. Piketty describes the stability argument thus. Quote, if one begins to question property rights acquired in the past and the inequality that derives from them in the name of a conception of social justice that might not be agreed upon, doesn't one run the risk of not knowing where this dangerous process will end? Political instability and chaos may then ensue. Redistribution is a Pandora's box that should never be opened. 
The normative shallowness of this argument is revealed by the fact that the very same reason was often given for why slavery couldn't be abolished. This indicates the enormous power the specter of social instability has had in justifying existing distributions of property, regardless of its origin or what it entitles its owner to do. This power has extended even to the ownership of other persons, something that so blatantly violates the justification of private property in the name of freedom, that trying to imagine how slavery could be defended in this manner truly boggles the mind. Some 19th century critics of capitalism responded to the dominant ideology of property ownership by rejecting or appearing to reject the right to own property altogether. Think of Proudhon's uh, pronouncement, property is theft. Proudhon later denied that he meant to reject all forms of property. He regarded the right to own products of one's own labor as defensible. But in doing so, he failed to make clear why private property might be not just admissible, but within in limits important to a free society. Something similar is true for Marx, although he restricts Proudhon's claim that property is theft in its literal meaning to the original accumulation of capitalist property. He often seems to advocate eliminating private property altogether, when surely what he means to advocate is only the elimination of private property in the means of production. But like Proudhon, Marx isn't clear as to whether ownership of all personal property is to be rejected, and if not, what importance such property might have in a post-capitalist world. Does he really think, as he sometimes seems to suggest, that once capitalism is abolished, all property should be social collective property? Alongside the defenders of a nearly absolute right of private property on the one hand, and radical critics of private property on the other, there's a third group of philosophers whose view offer a more satisfying way to think about both the importance of private property and its limits. I include in this group Rousseau, Hegel, and there are certainly others who, Piketty, and there are certainly others who belong to it, Rawls would be one of them. An important, an important first step these thinkers take is to denaturalize our, our, our idea of private property and the rights it entails. This is the import of Rousseau's rejection of, of Locke's appeal to natural law in defending inegalitarian property arrangements. A similar step taken by Hegel is to de-rationalize or to deontologize, sorry, de, I meant to say de deontologize private property. That is to deny that the rules of property ownership can be, deduced, can be deduced for once and for all through pure reason alone. De-rationalizing private property in this sense doesn't impl imply denying its rationality altogether. Historicizing our conception of reason as Hegel does is a more attractive alternative. In short, if property rights are created by us rather than legislated by God, nature, or pure reason, then space opens up for us to think about what human purposes such rights serve, what consequences they're likely to have, and whether those rights, when unrestricted, conflict with other social values we're committed to. Another commonality of Rousseau's, Hegel's, and Piketty's positions is an explicit intention to defend private property as an important institution that realizes a kind of freedom for individuals, while at the same time affirming that however important property rights might be, they don't give owners an absolute right to use their property as they wish. There are two general strategies for limiting property rights in this way. One is a broadly consequentialist strategy that limits property rights and therefore, thereby inequality in the name of the right of all citizens to achieve certain levels of well being or welfare. The other strategy, espoused by Rousseau and Hegel, imposes limits on the right to use one's property whenever inequality violates the freedom of some. In these cases, violations of freedom are understood as violations of a different type of freedom. That is when we're talking about property, if bringing about certain violations of freedom, the freedom we're talking about there is understood by these thinkers as a different type of freedom from the one that private property is thought to realize. Both strategies go beyond the positions of Kant, Locke, and Nozick, who focus on the free character of individual exchanges of property 
and regard whatever conditions result from iterations of free exchange as a legitimate outcome. Rousseau, Hegel, Marx, and Piketty adopt a different and I think better approach that takes into account the probable systematic consequences of completely free exchange. When those consequences conflict with the fundamental interests of some participants in the network of exchange, these thinkers appealing to those consequences of limiting the extent of permissible inequalities. In Rousseau, this takes the form of rejecting Locke's idea that property rights are determined by a law of nature that holds independently of positive laws and regulates economic inter interactions without regard to their systematic consequences. The rejection of this idea is what underlies Rousseau's claim that, regardless of which laws might hold in a hypothetical state of nature, property rights in a legitimate republic must be limited not by a law of nature, but by the general will, which is to say that the systematic consequences of such rights must be compatible with the fundamental interests of every citizen. This is what Rousseau means when he says that the, writ, the right each person has to his own will is always subordinate to the right the community has to everything. It's a bit exaggerated as Rousseau's statements always are, but the basic idea is the one I've been trying to, to, to lay out. In other words, the consequences of social arrangements matter in determining their legitimacy, not in the way that consequences matter to utilitarians where a single value such as utility or pleasure is maximized, but rather with a view to whether those consequences are compatible with the fundamental interests of all. In Germany, this Rousseauian principle is inscribed into Article 14 of its Grundgesetz, or essentially its constitution, in the claim that the right to private property is legitimate only insofar as it serves the public good. This, I take it, is a rather radical thing to say about private property, not that it's necessarily res respected all that much in present-day Germany, but at least it's there in the constitution. Hegel takes a similar approach to defining property rights, although this might initially appear not to be the case. For his philosophy of right begins its account of the rational society by setting out an abstract right, the set of property rights that are implied merely by the ideal of personal freedom. Personal freedom for our purposes is just um, what Kant was thinking of as external freedom without regard to the social consequences such rights, property rights might have. This can seem similar to Locke's or Kant's approach, but in fact, it's closer to Rousseau's. This is because Hegel regards abstract right as merely a provisional account of property rights that gets revised in view of what we learn in later sections of the philosophy of right about other features of a rational society, such as the institutions of the family, civil society, and the constitutional state. The nature of the family, for example, implies that fathers who earn a living in civil society may not dispose of their property arbitrarily, but must use it to address the needs of their spouses and children. It also places limits on what fathers can do with their wealth in their wills. They cannot leave them to people outside the family or only very small amounts. And the fact that in civil society, an unregulated market necessarily produces extremes of poverty and wealth means for Hegel, that the state must place certain limits on the unrestricted rights of property owners that appeared to be justified back in the earlier sections of abstract right. Moreover, Hegel makes it clearer than Rousseau that what places restriction on property rights isn't only considerations of well being, but also the requirements of freedom, albeit a different conception of freedom from that which grounds property rights, a type of freedom that I call social freedom. In other words, Hegel criticizes the inequality that civil society tends to produce, not primarily because it makes some of its members poor, but because their poverty prevents them from realizing certain kinds of freedom that participation in modern civil society generally makes available to its members. One advantage of Hegel's position is that it acknowledges the importance of there being some social space within which persons are free to exercise their arbitrary will to do what they want. Want. 
but it limits that sphere when doing so is necessary to avoid its point. One still relevant implication of Hegel's approach is that a critique of unrestricted property rights and hence a critique of inequality must go together with a critique of the highly individualistic conceptions of freedom to which Locke, Kant, and other theologians of private property appeal and that have come to dominate political discourse not only in the more libertarian societies of the US and UK, but also in part in European states that have been traditionally less hostile to socialism. Here then, you might say, is the main claim of my talk. Criticizing inequality effectively depends on expanding the conception of freedom now dominant in American political discourse, and on expanding that conception in the manner of Rousseau and Hegel, so as to be less individualistic, so as to include, in other words, conceptions of freedom in which the relevant agent isn't an individual, but a we that acts together, thereby achieving ends embedded in collective projects that individuals can't achieve on their own. Notice too that once we begin talking about we's and collective projects, new possibilities open up for thinking of property and the specific freedom it entails that diverge from private property in the classical sense, namely property that's owned by individuals. Hegel expressly endorses forms of collectively owned property when considering the economic resources of both the family and the corporations that arise in civil society. There's every reason for social theorists today to extend this idea to other forms of collectively owned property not explicitly considered by Hegel. Other forms of individualism must be combated too. For example, by emphasizing that regardless of what other rewards the free market might assign to individual participants, all wealth is the product of an intricate cooperative enterprise and social product any one person deserves on that basis. Piketty expresses this obvious but often unrecognized point as follows, again a quotation, the accumulation of wealth is always the fruit of a social process, which depends on public infrastructure, the social division of labor, and the knowledge accumulated by humankind over the centuries. The implication of this thought, fundamental to Rawls's theory of justice, by the way, is anticipated by Rousseau more radically in his claim that property owners should be regarded not as private individuals with fully exclusionary rights to what they own, but rather as trustees of public goods who are subject to the requirements of justice as articulated in the idea of the general will. I've been arguing here that although historically economic inequality has most often defended only in, been defended only indirectly as a possibly unfortunate but legitimate outcome, of the exercise of the kind of freedom that's realized in property rights, we shouldn't take this to imply a wholesale rejection of property rights, but rather a commitment to qualify them, to deny their absolute status in the name of other values, including other less individualistic conceptions of freedom. This general claim doesn't yet translate into concrete policy plans, and I'm not gonna be of much help in doing this today either. Although the broad recommendations offered by Piketty even if incomplete, can at least orient our thinking about how to limit property rights in the name of reducing inequality. So in the time that remains, I'd like to point to just some of his ideas for limiting property rights that are consistent with the argument I've outlined here. In concluding his first book on inequality, Piketty notes the need for developing new forms of property and the democratic control of capital. These might sound like two aims, but in fact, both fit under the single rubric of federal control over capital would substantially restrict the nearly unlimited rights that owners of capital in the West currently enjoy. Piketty's proposals for new forms of property fall into three categories, and I'm just gonna mention each one briefly. The first is public property, property that's owned and managed by states or local governments for the benefit of the community as a whole. This, of course, isn't a new form of property, to some extent, Piketty is advocating a return to an expansion of the kinds of mixed economies developed in Germany, the UK, and other European countries during the second half of the 20th century, when approximately 25% of all wealth was publicly owned. 
not merely infrastructure and hospitals and postal services, but also banks, coal mines, and automobile factories. The point of public property isn't merely to counterbalance the political power of private capital, but also to use state-owned wealth to fund measures that reduce economic inequality, such as ensuring more equal access to education. A second new form of property is social ownership. The idea here is that while some firms remain privately owned, they should become more socially managed than in traditional capitalism. In other words, the ownership of capital would no longer entail an unlimited right to dictate how capital is invested in production organized, independently of the interests of those whose labor is essential to capital's reproduction. In other words, ownership of the means of production is, need not imply exclusive control of them. Worker-owned cooperatives and the German practice of worker Mitbestimmung co-determination are examples of social ownership, both of which emphasize the importance of democratic decision-making, not only in the political sphere, but also at the site of production. Finally, the term temporary property captures the idea that there can be temporal limits to ownership, where owning something brings with it no presumption that one owns it indefinitely. The policy recommendation Piketty is best known for, an annual progressive global tax on wealth, is an example of treating property as having temporal limits, as are progressive tax progressive taxation schemes. Substantial tax that ownership rights don't survive the death or don't entirely survive the death of property owners on change. This measure is especially important since the accumulation of inherited wealth over generations is a principal source of inequality, and the severe erosion of inheritance in the West is one reason for its alarming rise since 1980. Anyone familiar with the history of the past century will recognize that none of these new forms of property represent completely novel ideas. Although Piketty amplifies the, amplifies the old ideas with some details that have never been tried out. In fact, Piketty's policy recommendations for reducing inequality could be summarized as advocating a return to and an expansion of the social democracy of post-war Europe, which since 1980 has been steadily dismantled to the point of near extinction. Piketty wants a social dem democracy for the 21st century that's more thoroughly social and democratic, as well as more experimental, that's probably important to say, than social democracies of the past. So much so that he refers to this deepened form of social democracy as participatory socialism. Now, the problems, or some of the problems, or just a few of the many problems. Piketty acknowledges that the Obstacles to achieving participatory socialism and to reducing economic inequality are daunting. He devotes much time to trying to understand why social democracy of the past century failed ultimately to sustain itself. And one can't but wonder whether some of the reasons he adduces for its decline might not also pose hindrances to contemporary efforts to realize participatory socialism. As Piketty notes, social democracy flourished in Western Europe at the same time that there existed a competing model of socialism in the East that in certain respects did a better job of guaranteeing a basic standard of living to all and unrestrained capitalism is capable of. It's probably no accident that the dissolution of social democracy in the West coincided with the demise of the alternate, alternate socialist model in the East. This raises a question for movements that aim to reduce inequality today. Can the political will be found to resuscitate social democracy if the countries we measure ourselves against today are not the Soviet Union, but contemporary Russia, Venezuela, or Vietnam? A more important respect in which our situation today is less favorable to social democracy than in the 20th century is the drastically increased global character of economic life. To mention just one example, Piketty recognizes that the annual tax on wealth that's so important to reducing inequality can be accomplished only at the global level. The serious obstacle to this posed by the fact that political decisions are still largely taken at the national state level is obvious. And the past record of supranational organizations like the European Union as 
currently constituted give us little reason for optimism. Although one should also note small advances, such as the recent still non-binding agreement to tax corporations at a minimal rate of 15% worldwide. The decidedly un-Marxist idea that it's possible to build socialism in one country seems even less plausible today than when Stalin and Trotsky placed that question at the center of Marxist debate. Finally, and most disturbing of all, much of post-war Western Europe shaped its future against the background of a decisive military victory against global fascism that gave progressive forces a hard-won confidence that political and social reform could improve the lot of all. And that the deep inequalities that characterized Europe prior to World War I. Now, for whatever reasons, the ideological situation in which we find ourselves is nearly the opposite. As neoliberal regimes produce increasingly dysfunctional societies, their members are quickly losing faith in the values that social democracy requires. And to the rest of the world, the social systems of the West appear increasingly to be a historical dead end. It's hard to avoid the discouraging impression that China represents our future, which despite being authoritarian and undemocratic, might still look better than the xenophobic fascism towards which the West seems to be headed. Something like Piketty's participatory socialism may be what we need, but at least at the moment, the momentum of history doesn't seem to be on its side. It gives me no pleasure to end this lecture on such a pessimistic note, and I haven't even mentioned climate change, but I fear that any other attitude would be disingenuous. The slogan socialism or barbarism has never been truer than it is today. Unfortunately, there's no guarantee that barbarism will not be our fate. As a student of Rousseau, I take seriously the possibility envisaged by his discourse on inequality that our corrupted society has developed to the point where, although we can imagine what a better society would look like, and even one that's in principle possible for human beings, there's no way to get there from where we presently are. Unlike Marxists of the past, we can no longer seek relief in the comforting reassurance that the forces of history are on the side of freedom and social justice. If there's any modicum of hope to be found, and I'm not sure there is, it resides in my scene before me, at least in my class today, a lot of students turned up. A younger generation that's less cynical, less disappointed, and less exhausted than my own generation is. You are a generation that has the dubious advantage, perhaps, of literally having no other choice than to fight for meaningful change. And many of you appear to be increasingly aware of our grave predicament. That's it. Thank you. So let me say that someone told me that that really affected the way that I was speaking about some of these issues was that it you had a million seconds, it was eleven days, but if you had a billion seconds, it would be thirty-one years. And that somehow made the magnitude of what's going on more visceral for me. But what I find is when I try to talk to people about it who clearly don't have wealth, they are defending wealth of that magnitude. And I, I, I struggle with what do you say to these people? How, how do you open that how do you open their minds? You're asking me that? <laughs> I don't know. No one knows. I mean, I have no idea. The first thing you said, I didn't quite understand. When you say you, you think of a billion seconds as 30 years, was that something that yeah. gave you? 
I believe you. Okay, I believe you. You believe it and it's true. Yes. You believe it because it's true. I totally believe you. I but what it did was it made the magnitude of what these oligarchs are controlling clearer to me somehow. Uh, I thought I thought you were saying that thought that there's 30 years left no, means no. that we can feel comfort and no, no. okay because I'm not sure there are 30 years left. But looking at the difference between a million years, oh a I see oh got you now okay days, all right yeah and a billion is 31 years right got you because I was saying like these statistics you don't really know because these these differences in numbers don't mean a thing mean that's a way of making the meaning that's thing the got you have you tried that on your friends I yeah. tried that. <laughs> yeah, I really don't know what to say. I mean, I think most of us have family members who hold views like this. I at least do. And I am at a loss as to how to talk about these issues right now. Maybe other people in the audience have ideas. I mean, I guess maybe I would say one thing is that if so, if actually, if actual discussion is a possibility here for changing people's minds, and I don't even know if that's true at the moment, it just doesn't it seem to be. I guess one thing I would have to say is that the discussion has to be a discussion that doesn't display contempt to the person you're talking to. And that is also a big problem with the so-called lefts, leftists, the left, progressives, and so on. At the very least, the people they we talk to have the feeling of being held in contempt by those who are telling them the truths about property and riches. That's far from being a solution. Sorry. Uh, yeah. I said, no, I said I'd much prefer China than xenophobic fascism. But that's kind of a, that's, yeah, that's kind of a depressing thing too. China's an authoritarian society. It is, it is. but the first question, um, I'm not quite sure what you, I'm not quite sure what you were asking. I thought you were asking what to do about the fact that um, that unlimited rights of private property are regarded as something almost like a first principle, almost something natural that are not in need of justification. Let's say not natural, but, but self-evident. Yeah. Um, and so what's the question about that exactly? <laughs> I don't see how that I don't see how that property how that question is connected with the question I thought you were asking. That's why I'm having trouble. What is property? Uh, there are lots of definitions, and if you were a property lawyer, you could talk up here for you know a semester of what property is. I'm just starting off with a, with a very basic classical understanding that property is in the first place. First place, private owned by individuals, 
and that oh, right to use it as you wish, as long as you don't infringe on the property or freedom rights of other people. And then what I'm saying is that Rousseau and Hegel, for example, accept something like that view of property and something like that view of why property is important in limited, within certain limits, but want to think about ways of imposing limits on that you know, unlimited right to do with your property what you want. I don't have a more um, sophisticated view of, of property is than that. I mean, it, it's already the case if you talk to property lawyers that this is very, this, this sort of very simple definition is already extremely far from what property is, is regarded as by law, even in countries like the United States. But yeah, these tend not to be limitations on private property that are made with a view towards the common good or you know, have that in mind as an end. That's interesting. Okay. <laughs> as, as... Yeah, I'm teaching a course right now on European social philosophy. We read Marx, Faber, and Smith. And the other person we read who I think is really important is Hegel on civil society. Sorry, that's yeah. that's interrupting your question. Well, when we look at society, we have a tendency to create a society that When I go to France, They overthrew the church, right? So it was really a rich period. And feudalism. Yeah, the feudalism. Or middle class, yeah. And now they say that French is wrong. But then it would justify it. Although actually right now there's a general strike going on in France. So these things are so fluid that I don't think you can trust anyone who's saying this is where things are. And what the possibilities are, impossibilities are. It's extremely fluid. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 So are you are you challenging these ideas or supporting? 
So I'm a little bit uncomfortable with saying the French Revolution wasn't a real revolution, no, no, but it, it certainly had its limits. And I think it would also be wrong to say that it didn't bring, it didn't decrease inequality in certain really important ways. It may have opened a world to a different form of inequality. Ah, uh, sort of under the under the under the ideas of bourgeois property ownership, the sacrosanctness of property ownership. Thank you, sir. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm being clear since I have kind of a loaded statement, but I'm precise about it. And I also don't want to dive into what you wish to say or what I wish to say. So allow me to center my voice. Proud uh, to hear. Um, And as a question, but like a sort of counter argument that I'm not disrespectful or anything. But are you worried that perhaps a socialist understanding of the issue of inequality might actually result in inequality not being able to be solved? Because you have one specific enemy. Um, and for the record, I'm more of a centrist libertarian type, but. The biggest issue that I see today is that quality, and uh, I feel like that's one of the things that should be solving. However, I'm worried that perhaps like political changes must be made in order to like solve problems like these. But if we pin all of the blame on just one series of aggressors and not heavily criticize or counteract the efforts of other people who are in power, like for instance, the political regime in Turkey of China, who can just as xenophobic, racist, and fascist as the worst of these kinds of governments we have here in the Western world. I mean, like there's it's literally still kind of a tall principle inside of this, uh, their country is the center of the universe. And it's Nearly as bad. Unlike the United States. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, okay. I see the laws in these other cultures that we see here. Um, and the way that I see it is that it isn't necessarily a result of capitalists, but just individuals and organizations who band together in order to efficiently take power away from the general population. And if we only hold capitalists as the enemy to public goodwill, then we will find ourselves like blind to what these other bad state actors will try to do to our society. I don't I don't think that a big pogrom of people just doing a pogrom of people who are different from me is going to stop that. But what sort of safeguards can we put in our society to just stop these power systems? Who needlessly injure so many people in order to enrich themselves and their families. And that's it. Okay, can I can I respond to just one point you made at the very beginning, which is how do we know that in a socialist world of this sort, you know, these are very sort of vague suggestions still. Marx himself only had very vague suggestions about what communism or socialism would look like. Um isn't it? Isn't there always a danger that um, a set of attempts to, to decrease inequality will have the unintended effect of bringing about new forms of inequality? And I think that's actually true. And something we can't know that in advance. We can't, you know, predict that in advance. We can't say in advance how to resolve to resolve a problem that arises. But that is definitely a problem that. Um, people who want political change need to not lose sight of. Um, we already mentioned with the French Revolution, how getting rid of uh, certain kinds of inequalities opened the door to certain other kinds of inequalities. 
And I'm not, I don't mean to be blaming any of the actors in the French Revolution. I mean, this is just how, this is the nature of social change. It's really hard to predict and hard to manage. But what I would take from your comment is that we should be alert to the possibilities that what we do, what we try to do in the name of progressive change might have unintended effects, especially on inequality, but other effects too, that we need to be um, open to criticizing and thinking about how to, how to deal with them. Um, yeah, so well, thank you for that. From the first question, uh, reminded me of how sometimes in my classes I tried to crystallize the uh, inequality and what I did was look at not just the average worker in Walmart compared to the CEO of Walmart, which was like a thousand times or something. Uh, and uh, the thing with capitalism, capitalism is a capitalist capital. You know, and then having a billion dollars gets you the second and so I, in contrast, the CEO getting twenty million dollars for working very hard, and Sam Walton for having his wealth uh, through working very hard. Uh, to uh, there's a grandson who probably earns something like four hundred million dollars a year just in dividends on uh, Walmart stock for doing absolutely nothing. He never created the company. He doesn't work for the company. Uh, he's not a CEO. He does nothing. Absolutely nothing, and gets much more than the CEO of Walmart gets. Uh, but that doesn't work for my students. It doesn't so, work on your students. That's what I was just going to say. But my question is a little related to that. I, I was just just realized that one difference between the period between the Depression and 1980. When everyone in society was gaining well uh, income, at least, and uh, the amount that went to capital was less, and labor was reporting a lot. Uh, and our current times and the Gilded Age before that, is it does seem like there's a personalization of capital, where as Rockefeller and Carnegie in the early period were individual uh, um, captains of industry. And maybe I'm just ignorant, but I think in the 50s and 60s when you had IBM and Boeing and all this stuff, I don't think you had, you know, the Elon Musk's and uh, the uh, uh, with Steve Jobs or Bill Gates. So, uh, and that seems to have come about in this new era of capital, where in, in between was the development of corporations where there's individuals coming together to own capital. But it seems to also be a return to an individual. Now, these people don't own the entire corporation, but they own some of their people. Uh, is there, is there, well, so my question, I guess, is why, why is there that um, happening? And was there a different corporate structure in the 50s? You know, that lack of, con lack of international competition, strength of unions, other laws uh, helped uh, uh, reduce inequality. But what helped reduce individual captains of the industry? But you're really talking about how how the public perceived capitalists. And what you were saying, if I understood you correctly, was that there's a period where we thought of capitalists as individual figures. And then there was this long period where we started thinking more of corporations that didn't have particular individuals in mind. And now we're back in some era where we individualize capital again. But I think there's a reality there. I think that Musk has more I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. But are you suggesting that when capitalism, when capital gets personalized in this form, that that makes it harder to criticize or easier to criticize? I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, okay. I mean, my thought was that it makes it might make it more difficult to criticize. Because the myths of like the super geniuses, of the, they talk about like, like he's a god, you know, he, the, the super qualities of this individual. And then also when we personalize and we talk about grandfathers passing on their millions to their grandsons, we start thinking, oh, that's grandson, grandfather, you know, that's family. 
it, it might be that personalizing it makes it harder to criticize because we tend to see it then in personal terms rather than in structural structural terms. But I can't answer your factual question about why it's different. But I understand. I understand what. You're the income tax yeah. was 91%. Highest rate. Yeah. Yeah, but I don't know if that's if that's what the cause of his, maybe, I don't know if that's the cause of the phenomenon he's talking about. Are you thinking it is? Uh -huh. Oh, I see what you're saying, yeah. So the, the claim here is that during those years you're referring to, incomes were just taxed so much more progressively, as it were, that it was harder for these super individuals to arise, rise up like that. That's the idea. By the way, this is the one, one of the great things about Piketty's book for me, or reading Piketty's books, is he points out certain facts about our own history, that our own recent history, that were just utterly surprising to me, like, in the 50s, Eisenhower era republicanism, the highest tax rate was 90%. And no one thought that was. And, you know, we look at that today and we think there's no way we can like raise the tax. I think now it's something like 40%, the highest tax rate. Not on, not on, not on capital gains. That's on income. Yeah. I think it's higher than 35. But anyway, it doesn't matter. It's low compared to 90%. Um, and we've got this idea that that's just sort of a natural limit you can't go beyond. No, we're never, ever going to be able to get that accepted. And um, reading Piketty made me realize that these things that I take as kind of ironclad limits are, are not at all, that these, these things are also in flux. I also think that, you know, I'm not a historian, but I also think that the experience of the two world wars made something like that more palatable, more possible than um, today. Something about, um, God, it reminds me of Hegel's view about the positive natures of, of war, that it, 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 you, you, you get in touch with what really matters and it, the, the unending accumulation of wealth isn't, doesn't seem like the most important thing. That's all I mean to be saying. Which maybe, which means that maybe we should be, you know, there's a there's a silver lining in the thought that World War Three is on the on the horizon. Of which department? I have some standing with thank you. Yeah, so thank you for your leadership. And I think something I want to push back on before I think about this is the lack of good And I think the reason I think you know it is because the function of private property within the settler. Within what? Settler global. And then the United States is being established actually through black and improving the land and development that are necessary ways to now the genocide and the abolition of people. Right? And they're playing not to get it right, but to sort of develop under that that is part of that, right? Like their ancestors, their mother. Their land, and it's not that they're doing the kind of as well. So I think I want to push a little bit back on World War Three, or I, I, I didn't mean that seriously. Well, I think I want to push back on World War One and World War Two to the way that we Right. I'm worried about that and in what you're talking about. And I'm settling with, sorry, there we go. 
activity with public property or let it take collective goods. And then we see something like Bears Ears National Park. And Bears Ears highly sacred and several First Nations. Oh, right, 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 right. And being taken by the United States. Yeah. Obviously not. <laughs> So let me just respond with two things. First of all, um, when I was thinking about forms of collective property, I wasn't thinking about, so, so I did talk about um, state owned property. When I was talking about collective property, I was thinking about collective property on a much more local basis, not at something like that. Now, even there, there's always a danger with a collective and a we, that those we's or collectives are gonna be um, antagonistic to those who are not outside. And so that's another danger that has to be um, one has to be alert to. But I wouldn't I wouldn't want to just from, from the example of the national park I wouldn't want to just say that that means we shouldn't place any hope in nationalized property. I think it's it's done good things and we should use it when we can. The postal service. No, I'm serious. Us. Who are you thinking gets excluded by the postal service? Okay. But the answer to that is not to say no more, no more nationalized property. Yeah. I'm not look, that's what that's what in some ways that's what the point of the of the the critique of that, that, that it's not really a critique, but the observation that the nation state stands in the way of some of these measures that we have to take. It's for different reasons than you're thinking of, but it's still the idea that being organized primarily in nation states is a huge obstacle still to even these more moderate um, attempts to limit, limit private property. So I just noticed that it's five. Uh, I know there are more questions, but uh, out of respect for other people's signs, I want to end the lecture right now and then I invite you to the world again. Greg will be fine uh, talking to us in a more informal setting. Thanks. So please uh, help me. Uh, thank you for your work. Thank you. I want to say something.